Nanbury by Jackie French, chapter 24. Nanbury, Sydney Cove, 18th of February, 1790. Nanbury sat at the table, his elbows pressed politely close to his body, his freshly ironed shirt crisp and warm against his skin. There were scrambled eggs and toast and honey for breakfast. He had helped make the toast, holding the slices of bread up to the fire on a metal three-pronged toasting fork. He had found the honey too, climbing up a tree and filling a bucket with the dripping comb. Father White had patted his head and said he was a fine lad, and then smiled and suggested that perhaps next time he climbed a tree he shouldn't take all his clothes off, especially when there might be ladies about. But how could your knees grip a tree trunk properly in trousers? There was a lot to learn, even when you had been English, through nearly a whole circle of the stars. For a while, he had wondered if his skin would turn white too. Now that he wore clothes and lived in a ghost house, but his skin was as dark as before. He did not let himself think about the catechal. They were dead these days, dead to him, even if two others still lived. You did not think about the dead in case their ghosts came to haunt you. And that was true, for whenever he thought about his family and friends, he felt like the convicts must have when they were lashed for not working or for being rude to important people. But his pain was inside him, not on his back. It would be easier to bear pain on my back, he thought. He did not talk to Benelong or Benelong to him anymore. Benelong had enough English words now to talk directly to the governor, who he called Bianga or father. Sometimes Nanbury saw the two of them walk around the town, the governor in his fine coat and Benelong in one almost as fine, the iron ring still around his leg, his convict keeper trailing them with the other end of the rope in his hand. Well, are we all ready? Father White smiled. Nanbury forced himself out of his dream. It was good to see Father White smile. He was still worried about the big ships that didn't come, about the convicts and marines who grew thin and tired because they would eat only what came from the stores. There was little food left now. But there was lots of food in the surgeon's garden and plenty of fish in the sea. Nanbury had grown almost as tall as a spear. Maria had put longer legs on his trousers and made a coat of Father White's fit him. She'd pulled apart ragged stockings to knit him new ones. Maria could knit cloth that was as warm as an opossum's skin. Nanbury watched Father White dab his lips with his napkin and stand up from the breakfast table. I'm ready, sir. Maria stood at the table with her hat on and her coat, even though the day was warm. Nanbury tried not to bounce with excitement. Today was a great day. Uh, what was the word? A grand day. Today, Father White and he and Maria were to move into a new house, a big house made of bricks with a slate roof, not this hut where water dribbled in when it rained. Something squeaked from the window ledge. Nanbury grinned. Father White and his people and his bungu, no, his opossum, were to move. It was still strange living with an opossum, almost as strange as sleeping on a bed off the floor and having times for meals instead of eating when there was food or when you were hungry. There was food in the morning and during the day and just before the sunset too. If you ate at the right time, you could eat as much as you wanted, except for wheat bread and salt meat. Nanbury didn't mind. Salt meat stank. It wasn't proper food. Bread was good, especially with honey, but cornbread made good toast and corn cobs were even better. Father White put his head out the door and made some sort of signal. Men came, men in bare feet and dirty rags, not like Nanbury's clean pressed shirts and trousers. Nanbury looked at his clothes proudly. Father White had even shown him how to make his boots shine. The ragged men began to lift all that could be moved. Already the sacks and boxes from the storeroom had been taken. Now beds, tables and Maria's big pot were grabbed and hauled away. Father White put on his hat and coat. He led the way up the track between the huts, Maria walking behind, holding a bundle of her own things. Nanbury and Father White carried nothing, like true warriors. The summer sun beat down on them, making him sweat in his clothes. Something screamed behind them. 
Nanbury turned. It was the opossum shrieking at the convict who carried his basket. The angry animal jumped out of the basket and clambered up a tree. It chittered angrily down at them again. Nanbury laughed. So did Father White. Even Maria gave a smile. Maybe the opossum will stay here, she said hopefully. Father White smiled. The new house is only just up the hill. I suspect he'll find us. Just as long as he doesn't find the sack of apples again, muttered Maria as they reached the house. It was so big. Nanbury ran from room to room as the men put beds and tables down. Maria was bustling about and telling them what to do. A cattigal man would have bashed her on the head with his axe for speaking to him like that, but here Maria was important because Father White was important, just as Nanbury was important now too. The house had a big kitchen and a storeroom and a study too. Upstairs, stairs were stacks of wood you could run up and down. There were rooms for him and Maria and Father White. There were shutters at the windows to keep out the wind and a smooth wooden floor that bounced a little when he jumped up and down on it. His room was as big as the old hut's kitchen. It had a window that looked down to the harbour so he could see if a big ship sailed in. Put the bed there, he said to the convicts as they lugged it into the room. He knelt on the pallet and looked out the window again. He could see the harbour from his bed and someone with dark skin splashing in the waves. It was Burong. Father White, Father White, may I go and swim, please? Drat, the boy can't. You do something useful? Maria bustled in with an armful of sheets. Let him have a day of play, came Father White's voice from the hall. Something small and dark ran up the stairs and then dashed under the bed. A small furry face, an angry face, peered out. The opossum gave a short, sharp scream. Your friend has found us already, Father White said to Maria. Maria snorted. Nanbury laughed again and ran downstairs. Burong was only a girl, but it would be good, just for a while, to speak to someone without having to work out the words. Besides, he knew lots more English words than her and could show them off. Nanbury ran down to the waves, yelling as he leapt over the rocks and into the water, diving down into the blueness, and then swimming up towards the sunlight, his wet clothes dragging at his body. Burong laughed as he poked his head out of the water and waved at her. It's almost like it was before, a small voice whispered, when you swam while your people feasted and life was good. Nanbury shut that voice away. He lived in a grand house. He had Father White who was proud of him. He was not like Benelong with a chain around his leg. It was good, yes, it was good to be English. Chapter 25, Surgeon White, Cockle Bay, April 1790. The fishing boat bobbed and the waves splashed its sides. Nanbury peered down at the nets, excited by the splash of fish. The surgeon smiled. The lad's laughter was one of the great comforts of his life. All at once the boy looked up, his gaze entranced. Father White, the big ship is sailing. The surgeon looked over towards the rocky headland, his heart leaping with hope that it might be a ship from England. But it was only the tiny supply... The supply was the only ship the colony had left, now that the Sirius had been wrecked on Norfolk Island. It had been taken, it had been taking another load of convicts and supplies to the small outpost there, and the troublesome Major Ross to try to stop him urging his marines to open rebellion. The supply was heading for Batavia in a desperate attempt to buy food to keep the colony alive through winter. There had been little this year from the wheat harvest, although the corn crop had been good. The weekly ration was only two pounds of flour now, two pounds of salt meat or ten pounds of fresh fish, and a cup of rice and weevils, or dried peas and weevils. It was enough to keep a man alive, but only just. The colony had huddled on this barren shore for nearly two and a half years now, and still not a sail had been seen from England. Why hadn't a ship come? Sometimes it seemed as though home must have vanished off the earth. At other times he wondered if this land had wandered further south in the great ocean so no one would ever find them again. Foolish thoughts for a scientist, but no one could help the dreams that came at night. The surgeon stared at the hovels 
that lined Sydney Cove, the small farming plots, the vast green wilderness of trees behind them. There were still hardly a dozen brick houses in the colony, and even those would probably crumble in ten years. The rest were mud and wattle, roofed with bark. Could they even last a third winter? He shook his head. There was no clothing to be had in the stores now, no medicines except the remedies so new to him that Arabinu had told him about, like the oil from the eucalyptus leaves that helped the itch and congestion of the lungs. No more dried peas, no wine. His fishing brought in enough to feed his household, but no more. Even the fish had mostly vanished from the harbour. Only Benelong still ate all the bread that he wanted in the colony now. The governor was afraid that if the native knew how little food and gunpowder the colony had, he might tell his old friends and they'd just maybe escape. If the Indians attacked now, they couldn't defend themselves. Starvation or murder, thought the surgeon, which will happen first. He looked at his adopted son again, peering down to see whether a fish swam near the nets. He had been right. The lad was a comfort to him. At least he could see that the boy and Maria didn't starve. I'll take you out shooting tonight, he said suddenly. The lad grinned up at him like he'd offered the crown jewels. I can fire a big musket? Yes, lad. We will shoot a kangaroo, said Nambry joyfully. I'll show you where they graze. We will be warriors. Yes, lad. The more meat, the better, thought the surgeon. The surgeon watched the supply change course, avoiding the rocks. Poor leaky little ship with the treacherous reefs and storms between here and Batavia. If only they could all sail away on her. But she could carry 50 men at best. Could she even get to Batavia? Could she make it back here? Even if she did, she'd be away for at least five months. How many would survive till then? The tiny ship was nearly past the headland now and then it was gone. An empty harbour, empty stores and empty hopes. It was time to haul in the nets to do a final round at the hospital, checking on the convicts who had unnecessary, who had unnecessary scurvy, the fools injured in fights because they hadn't learnt that so far from civilization, every life was precious. We are a small speck in our vast land across an even vaster ocean, he thought. Oh Lord, who sees a sparrow fall? Watch over us and protect us. I'll read that bit again. O oh Lord, who sees a sparrow fall, watch over us and protect us. Send us a ship, some food, some stores. Don't let us die here forgotten.